Greetings and welcome to our worship. Van Dickens here, pastor of the Monroe United Methodist Church in lovely Monroe, Iowa. Today marks the first Sunday of fall, where the temperature up here actually reflects the season when the leaves are beginning to change their fall colors. The goldenrod is also in bloom. Some of us allergic to goldenrod are well aware of that fact, but it's all good. It's all good. And with that, I invite us to begin our worship time in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord of life, we gather as your people to praise you, to worship you, and to lift our hearts to you. Only you are God. You made us and gave us this priceless gift of life. By your grace, may we strive to live after your example. Help us to be that lamp in those dark places, loving others as you love us. May we bear witness as those who thirst for righteousness and who have found the water that quenches. Be with those who are hurting, those who are afraid, any who are in serious illness or mental anguish. Especially, Lord, we pray for the family of Michael Williams, a former resident of Jasper County, that they may find comfort and that justice will prevail. We pray, Lord, for our students anywhere, especially those who have become ill. May your healing mercies be with them and all who have been afflicted by this terrible virus. Bless us now as we come in your name. Grant us the joy of our faith. We trust you. We believe in you. We love you, Lord. Our lives are in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the great composer of hymns at the turn of the last century was Charles Tendley. Self-educated African-American, he was a giant in the Methodist Church, having written such hymns as Leave It There and We Shall Overcome. Another song we find in our hymnal by Tendley is We'll Understand It Better By and By. And I've adapted a melody that came to me the other day to his lyrics. Cross your fingers. I hopefully won't cross mine. And uh, we'll see how this goes. We are tossed and driven on the restless sea of time. Somber skies and howling tempest off succeed a bright sunshine In that land of perfect day When the mists have rolled away We will understand it better by and by By and by When the morning comes When the saints of God are gathered home We'll tell the story of how we've overcome For we'll understand it better by and by We are often destitute of the things that life demands Want of food and want of shelter, thirsty hills and barren lands We are trusting in the Lord, and according to God's word We will understand it better by and by By and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home We'll tell the story of how we've overcome for we'll understand it better by and by. Trials darken every hand, and we cannot understand All the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land. But He guides us with His eye, and we'll follow till we die. For we'll understand it better by and by. By and by. When the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we'll tell the story of how we've overcome, for we'll understand it better by and by. Temptations, hidden snares, often take us unawares, and our hearts are made to bleed for a thoughtless word or deed. But we wonder why the test, when we try to do our best, but we'll understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we'll tell the story of how we've overcome. For we'll understand it better, we'll understand it better, we'll understand it better by and by. Great song of faith and trust in difficult days. Today's scripture is one we all know, at least I think we all know it. If you don't, you're in for a great story. 
It's found in Exodus, in chapter 17. Hear these words. From the wilderness of Sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put test? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I'll be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Years ago, my wife Kathy and I took a long weekend to the T-Bar M Retreat Center near New Braunfels, Texas. It's a, a wonderful place to go if you ever get the chance. After the retreat, we ventured to New Braunfels to see all there was to see, the Schlitterbahn, the great German restaurants, and stayed at a local hotel. That evening, we had just bedded down for the night and were about to turn out the light when I happened to look under my pillow. We were not alone. Bed bugs. Ah! After jumping up and down and screaming, bed bugs, bed bugs, we quickly decided that in the battle over who wins the bed, we waved the white flag and called the front desk. So I can understand why the Israelites, after a long day's journey to Rephidim, why they were not all that happy to discover there was no water there. You know, there are some things that are pretty basic for any good night's lodging, isn't it? Food, shelter, no bed bugs, and water, right? That and no dogs barking in the adjacent room if you're in a pet-friendly hotel. But some things you simply expect. But no water? The children were thirsty. You couldn't brush your teeth, couldn't take a shower. Nothing. What kind of place is this, Moses? True, they were roughing it, but come on, really? No water? Unacceptable. When Kath and I found bed bugs that night, we could have made a big stink about it, but we called the front desk and respectfully explained the problem. And they were only too kind, given what we discovered and offered to put us in a different room, which we accepted only to find more bed bugs. Ah! Not again, again, again. At which point we called management and management was more than happy to refund our money and Send us on our way. Said, There's nothing else we can do. Sorry. By then it was midnight. We were exhausted. But throughout the ordeal, we were respectful. We weren't ugly about it. These, these things happen, you know. Nobody planted the bed bugs, at least not on purpose, and we eventually found a hotel without bed bugs. But out there in the wilderness, without any water, the Israelites' reaction was a different story. The complaining and quarreling rose to new heights. The Israelites were not simply unhappy. They were mad, fighting mad. They were so mad. How mad were they? They were so mad. They were almost ready to stone Moses. Wow. I find it somewhat unusual and perhaps amusing that Moses tells the Lord that they were almost ready to stone him. Did you hear that? I mean, what's the difference between being almost ready and ready? Do you know? In my imagination, I picture Moses being surrounded by his own people. At one point, Moses can see the look on their faces with their eyes set on him and then glancing down at the rocks on the ground. You know what? Those sure are handy rocks. All we have to do is pick them up. Maybe Moses put two and two together and knew, they were th knew exactly what they were thinking. Maybe someone was bouncing a rock in his hand. Moses knew they thought that Moses and God had actually brought them out there to die of thirst. 
They're almost ready to stone me. Ever been in a situation where someone was almost ready to do something that threatened you? It's not a good situation to be in, is it? You're willing to do whatever it takes. When I was a, a freshman in college, I, I took a course in English 101. The first assignment the professor gave us was to write a story. It could be any story, about anything. So I wrote a true story that happened to me while walking in the fields, barefooted. Anyway, she didn't like that story at all and told me that I'm either going to get an F or I can write another story. And she made it very clear that she was almost ready to start my academic year with a bad grade. So I did what I had to do. I wrote another story, made a C. Truth is, that first story was a much better story, much more colorful, at least to uh, an 18-year-old. Uh, but then again, she was almost ready to give me an F, and I didn't want the F. Sometimes you do what you have to do. Moses turns to the Lord for help. They were almost ready to stone him. Well, on the surface, it's a story of a people in need. They cry out, God provides them with a miracle, and life goes on. But the truth is, water wasn't the only substance they lacked. Like water, it was something that robbed them of life if they didn't have it and gave life if they did have it. What they lacked was faith. And in this story, we see the beginning of a long cycle of belief followed by disbelief. God would deliver them and they would praise the Lord, but then times of trouble would follow them and they would disbelieve and quarrel. Moses would turn to the Lord, the Lord would deliver them, and they would believe again only to face another hardship and disbelieve and quarrel again in a vicious cycle of belief followed by disbelief. But that's not faith, sustaining faith, the kind of faith that lasts in hard times. That would come later. But through it all, God kept his promise and eventually led them into the promised land, numbering their descendants more than the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. But faith came hard for them. And the Lord had to exercise great patience and restraint. At times, Moses had to convince God not to have it out with his stiff-necked people who wanted what they wanted, when they wanted, here and now. frustrating not to get what you want when you want it. It's hard sometimes not to conclude that those who don't deliver on the goods may have other motives or else are simply falling down on the job. The Israelites thought Moses was falling down on the job or worse. Maybe Moses and by implication the Lord didn't really care. They said it in so many words. It explains why Moses named the place Massah and Meribah which means quarrel and test, because they quarreled and tested the Lord. They didn't just quarrel, they quarreled and tested Massah, Meribah. Little boy found a puppy on the side of the road by a landfill and took it home. After giving the puppy a dozen baths, the puppy smelled as bad as it did when he first picked it up. Named the puppy Stinky and Smelly. If, uh, his, his father suggested that the boy either name the puppy Stinky or Smelly if he's going to give it a bad name, but not, not both. The little boy shoved the puppy under his father's nose, after which his father declared, May his name forever be Stinky and Smelly. Moses thought, Gripe and give me a hard time, almost ready to stone me. I'll show you Masa and Meribah. From now on, whenever you pass by this place, Masa and Meribah. Maybe you'll remember then, Gripe and give me a hard time. Here's the sad part. You would think that after Moses strikes the rock and the water comes gushing forth and the people have their fill, they would rejoice and praise the Lord and worship the Lord and rejoice in the Lord and do everything people of faith do when they receive a miracle, right? But no, there's no mention of it. There's, no, there's zero mention of the things that express faith. Joy, gratitude, worship, no celebration of God's goodness and providence and salvation. And there were certainly no words for Moses for what they thought about doing to him. No, sorry about that stoning idea, Moses. Not even that. No, no, hallelujah, God has delivered us again. Not even so much as a thank you. Zero gratitude, zero acknowledgement. Not a, nothing. I want to read 
to you portions from Psalm 78. It's one of the longest psalms we have, so I'm not going to read all of it. It's called a maskil of Asaph, and the Hebrew is hard to translate, but what it basically means is that this psalm is an, oh yeah, I remember that now, kind of psalm. One writer says it's more like a kick-in-the-pants psalm for future generations. Anyway, here it is. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we've heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from our children, that they should not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose spirit was not faithful to God. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? Even though he struck the rock so that water gushed out, can he also give bread or provide meat for his people? Yet he, being compassionate, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They did not keep in mind his power or the day when he redeemed them from the foe. Psalm 78. I share this because in time Israel did remember God's goodness and mercy. They did remember those days in the wilderness when God was with them and provided for them with their daily needs. They did finally come to remember that there was more to life than mere survival, bread and water, and that it is the God of the covenant, the great I Am, Emmanuel, God with us, who was with them in those hard times and who is with them still. They remembered as they worshipped, and in the remembrance, they did more than survive. They lived. You and I are living in survival times, days when we hope and pray about many things we never thought we would have to hope and pray for. We hope and pray that loved ones will survive this modern plague. According to the Iowa State Education Association COVID tracker, there have been three infections in the PCM school system, according to this week's report. And we pray for those affected, their families, the teachers, the classes involved. We pray that our means of income will survive, that our retirement and Social Security will survive, that our voting process will survive, that the unity of this one nation under God with liberty and justice for all will survive. We pray that our community will survive, our local businesses. We pray that our local churches and our own church will survive. We pray that you and I will survive. But what God is trying to tell us through the Psalms and Exodus, through this ancient story about ancient people thousands of years ago out there in the wilderness, is that there is more to survival than surviving. There's more here than turning to God to give us what we need when we need it, and if we don't get it when we want it, wondering if God meant to bring us here only to die. There's more here than this. There's more here than worries and anxieties and questions. There's more than our anger when we cannot do the things we used to do or when others have a care less attitude or when we get into an unexpected argument with the checkout lady over something you didn't think was political only to realize these days how everything is political. It happened to me. There is more here than the mess we're in and the things we can't have and the things we can't do. Out there in the wilderness, the Israelites missed this. They missed the wonderful opportunity to see the something more that was happening in their midst, the, the thing that was holy and good and marvelous that came from God. They missed the miracle of the moment when the rock was struck and water came gushing out. They were so busy drinking it, they failed to stop and praise the one who quenched their thirst. They missed the God moment, the difference between surviving and living. Today, God is doing a marvelous thing in our midst. Can you see it? Can you hear it? Can you feel it? God is bringing us through these tough days. Time is moving on. We're moving on, hopefully moving forward. 
Hope is in the air that today's problems will come to an end, and before we know it, we'll be doing a lot of the things we used to do. We may end up doing them differently based on what we're doing now, and the day may not come when we want it to come or when we think it should come, but it will come. And the things we're learning about ourselves in the present time, they'll serve us well in the future. They are in the present. The new and different ways we've been reaching out in love and service to our neighbor in these days will shape who we are for years to come. You know, one of the things I've learned in our own modern wilderness time is the fact that I don't really need as many things as I thought I needed. I've simplified my life a lot. I have found a rhythm in my week to manage my time in order to get done the things that really matter. The other things I've let go of. And in doing so, I've reduced a lot of my stress. Remember in the Gospels, when Mary and Martha appeared to receive Jesus in their home, Martha was distracted by many things. While Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, she was focused on the one thing that mattered, that special moment with him. Some of you know I like to walk. Um, I see a lot of you walking in the neighborhood in Monroe. Fortunately, that's one thing we can do these days. I like to walk. When I was active duty, we did a lot of walking. A lot. We walked so much. How much did we walk? We walked so much, they gave it a different name. For us, it was called a hump. Others might call it a forced march, where you walk a greater distance than normal at a greater speed than normal, only we always humped at a greater distance than normal and at a greater speed than normal with a 55-pound load. That was our normal. One day we'd walk five miles, the next we'd walk seven, next we'd walk 10 miles, then 12, then 15, and 20, and 25 miles. A mile every 15 minutes, that's four miles an hour, by the way, with a 10-minute break every three miles. I discovered that those humps were meant for two things. The first was to condition you for the day when the stakes are high in the real situation of the world. The second was to teach you the difference between something that is hard from something that is miserable. Humps were more miserable than they were hard. They say misery likes company, so our company would go out and grab all the misery we could and do it together and never fall behind the executive officer. But somehow, I still like to walk. The other day I was out walking and I came upon a buck and two does. I stood still while those deer stared at me with their great big eyes and their ears at full attention, those ears that looked like wings. They were so big compared to their heads. It was a beautiful sight. On a different day, I might be thinking about venison and I know there are some hunters out there, but on that day, I just enjoyed watching them in the middle of nowhere, just me and them. It was a great moment. I live for moments like that. I forget about all my troubles and worries and the what-ifs and the unknowns, and I realize God has given me this special gift on this walk in this moment, and I get that. And that makes me feel good about myself, about God about those deer. Very quietly, so as to not disturb the deer, I whispered, Thank you, Lord. And I think I was able to hear, maybe faintly, but just loud enough to hear, a voice that said, You're welcome. When we gather for worship, whether it's in a sanctuary, in a park, online, in our homes, you and I remember that we were made for more than surviving. We were made for living. Sometimes we forget this when everything and everyone around us is jumping up and down and yelling, bed bugs, bed bugs, it's the end of the world. It's then that the Lord gives us a, a kick in the pants with a psalm reminding us of the lessons of our ancestors, what they were telling us as loudly as they possibly could, that we don't have to live the way they did. When times were hard and miserable and when they quarreled and fought with God. We can live as children of the Heavenly Father in the faith that God will provide in God's own time and in God's own way 
And when God does, for us to stop long enough and say, Thank you, Lord. Time will come when we will understand these days when we had to live by faith, and not by sight. Days when we learned to savor the God moments when they came. God is with us and will walk with us all the way. May you and I walk with him faithfully and thankfully. By and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we'll tell the story of how we can overcome. For we'll understand it better, we'll understand it better, we'll understand it better by and by. May God grant us grace to remember to give thanks for the living of these days, more than surviving. May we trust Him, and in that faith, live as children of the light. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of us now and always. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless and keep you.